me. Just, just all of my junk. Just <laughs> and yours too. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. See us. Sister Debbie Waters was taken to the ER early uh, in, in the night um, with some severe stomach pains and uh, don't know yet what the problem is. And, and so let's just really pray for her this morning, okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. On the platform. Amen. Amen. School. You need prayer for school? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Miss anybody? Is Mike's hand up? Yes, Mike. Okay. Mark and Laura are having some interesting times. Here. Mark and Laura, amen. Let's pray for them. Do pray for Kina and Kevin and Bridget. They are, as best I can figure out, in the Grand Canyon. And we want them to get out of the Grand Canyon. And... Uh, so just just uh, lift them up in prayer for traveling mercies. Let's let's stand together and just take all these needs before the Lord, shall we? Precious Lord God, we come before the throne of grace, and Lord, we just lift up your holy name to our so holy Lord. We thank you for this day, for this opportunity to gather together as your children. And we praise you, God. Amen. holy name lord god have your way lord jesus uh, we rejoice in you in jesus name thank you lord thank you lord thank you lord how do you explain how do you describe a love that flows from east to west and runs as deep as it is express the love that we feel but as long
of our love, listen to our hearts. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand years, I would still run out of time. So listen to my heart, and every beat will say, thank you for the life, thank you for the truth, thank you for the way. Let's just give him praise. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, I think I'll take some time to praise the Lord. For he has been, well, the Lord's been mighty good, good to me. me. I think I'll take some time to praise the Lord and thank him for saving me. I'll take some time to praise the Lord, for He has been. Well, the Lord's been mighty good to me, I think. I'll take some time to praise the Lord and thank Him for saving me. Oh, I think I'll take some time to praise the Lord, for He has been. Well, the Lord's been mighty good to me, I think. I'll take some time to praise the Lord and thank Him for saving me. Well, look what the Lord has done. Oh, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved just in time. Just in time. Oh, I'm gonna praise for a minute just rest rest a moment that's how we keep these chairs looking so good as we don't use them a whole lot <laughs> amen but it's okay to sit down every now and then praise God uh, we're going to have some ushers and uh, I'm going to worship the Lord in our giving well I hope that you're having a good week and I don't recall a week of better weather than we're having right now. It's the most marvelous thing. I get to drink my coffee on the deck at about 56 degrees, and then I get to enjoy the day that doesn't seem to get beyond about 75. And it's a beautiful sky, and the Lord blesses, and I hope that you feel as blessed as I do. Let's just uh, ask the Lord's blessings on our offering. Precious Lord, God, we love you. 
We praise you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for every blessing. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you have have provided for each of us, Lord God. We've all had something to eat. We've had a roof over our head. We've got clothes on our back. And, Lord, we are just so blessed. And, Lord, now we return a portion of that gain to the work of God, and we ask you to bless it and just let it go a long way and just have your way in each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. God. Well, Sister Douglas, I don't feel like we're quite through yet. So, whatever. strong and mighty tower, my prince of peace. You're my shelter from the storm. I find protection underneath your wing. Lord, you're my in the morning Lord you were there your love compasses me your touch changes my life and sets my spirit free yes you're my Oh 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to find the Bible, and uh, I was telling Mary Ann before church, you know, our, our, uh, our sound room people just do the best job they can with the information they have, and of course she was waiting for a list of scriptures, and I told her I would... I would give her a list of scriptures just as soon as I knew what I was going to preach this morning. <laughs> and uh, she thought I was joking. And uh, you hope I'm joking. But the truth of the matter is I have three messages that I need to preach today. And uh, while the pastor's out of town, y'all, anybody doing anything before 2 o'clock? <laughs> Oh, lunch. I'm sorry, lunch. Yes, that's, that's one of those things that we get in the habit of. And uh, so I was, I was telling Terry and Diane, I said, I think I'm just going to number these, script, or these, these messages, and I'm going to call it A, B, and C, and uh, have y'all vote on it. Um, and... Um, so Diane immediately said, oh, it's going to be A. And I said, well, this is all the notes I have for A. And uh, she said, oh, you won't need any. And uh, so I don't know. I'm still debating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to go to the book of Ephesians this morning. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I know Brother Sid will appreciate this. I, uh, I have a friend who is, is uh, he's retired now, but he was pastor of a of an, uh, Presbyterian church. And every Tuesday morning, you could drive by the Presbyterian church in Hendersonville and if you caught it at the right time, he would be out there putting up on the marquee the title for his message for the following Sunday on Tuesday morning. And uh, I told him one day, I said, Bill, God is so good to you. I said, he, he, he never gives me my message five days in advance. I said, in fact, I said, when I go to bed on Saturday night, if I don't have it yet, I don't worry a whole lot because it's not time to preach it yet. And the next morning, I said, generally speaking, God will speak to me in the night. And it's the most amazing thing, but some of you know what I'm talking about. He will speak to you in your sleep. Or he will wake you up and speak to you in your wake mm -hmm. to tell you things. And so for, for years, I got accustomed to that. The Lord and I would just have a little talk sometime in the night, sometimes on Saturday night. And it may be that I have, had settled my mind on what I wanted to, to bring before this congregation and and, and then typically he would change that about 6 o'clock on, on Sunday morning. And uh, so uh, we have a, he and I have a good working relationship. <laughs> he tells me what he wants when he wants to, and I just try to do it. So... Ephesians chapter 4, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. If you just stand with me for just a moment, just to honor the reading of the word of the Lord, and as I sometimes say, and just to be sure that everyone's awake. Verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering and forbearing one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body, 
one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And if I could, for just a few minutes, I want to speak to us on this subject, getting along until we finally get it. Let's pray. Precious Lord God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for every blessing you have given us, God, that we have your way. Lord, that you would just be a mighty work in each of us, that you would, uh, that you would help us, Lord God, just to find and stay in the center of your will. And Lord, that's not an easy thing for us, because we are human, we are flesh, and, uh, and we struggle. But, Lord, we just ask you for your blessing, and we ask you to do a work in us and through us in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. Lord bless you. You may rest yourself a little spell. Um, it's kind of interesting. Not very long ago, Pastor Kana and I did a one of our fireside chats, and just for those of you that perhaps have been keeping up with those, uh, you may have, have listened to this lesson that we did on the equipping gifts or the fivefold ministry from a part of this passage of Scripture. Um, and uh, and we've, we've been doing now a, a, a series. We're calling it the bodybuilding series. Um, and... Uh, so every, every, every Sunday evening at 5 o'clock or so, Mike is posting a new, a new video of, of Pastor Kana and I just uh, chatting. And we're, we call them fireside chats, but the fire is not lit, okay? Uh, I told her it was about time. We, we should have been doing poolside chats for the last three, <laughs> three uh, years, but, but, uh, or the last three months, but... Uh, uh, well, Michelle said we couldn't come out there and sit by her poo. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really ask her. Okay. Uh, but uh, I guess we could have just gotten a bucket of water and just, you know, sat around it. But, but, uh, but we've been doing our fireside chats, and, and, and we've been doing this series called Bodybuilding. Bodybuilding. And uh, the whole direction of that bodybuilding series is to build and strengthen and edify the body of Christ. Amen. And so we've been talking about things like the, the, the nine spiritual gifts found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we've, we've been talking about the, the five equipping gifts found here in this passage that I just read, and we've been, now we are now in the midst of talking about the nine service gifts that are found in, in 1 Corinthians as well as in Romans. And and so we've been doing that, and uh, and we've been having a great time. I don't know, if, I don't know if anybody's watching them or not, but we are having a great time. Uh, we just have a, a a wonderful, wonderful time, the the two of us, uh, and we just sit there for thirty to forty five minutes, and we just talk about these things, and it's kind of very informal, and uh, and uh, so uh, uh, I just wanted to. Ch just give you a little shout out about that because you know who knows you might not get enough preaching on Sunday morning you might need a little bit more to make it through the week so 
you can uh, see those episodes uh, on uh, their own YouTube, and they're also on uh, our website. Uh, no, I know our Facebook page. Facebook page. Uh, so you can go to our Facebook page and find them there. And uh, and th th I think the first uh, series of lessons we did was on actually on end time events, and uh, there was uh, several of those, twenty or so of those. Anyway. Uh, now, I just said all of that because God has been dealing with me about something else that we, in this passage of Scripture, that I wanted to bring to the forefront. And uh, to help you understand, to put a little structure to it, let me read two verses of Scripture. I'm, gonna go, I'm going back to Ephesians 4. I want to read verse number 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace... And then drop down to verse number 13. Um, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, if I can strip away all the modifiers in those two verses and just simply read the important part of those two verses, verse 3 endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Now, what does that really mean? Keep the unity of the Spirit until we come to the unity of the faith. Now, let me give you a hint. Everything between verse 3 and verse 13 is there for the very purpose of getting us from verse 3 to verse 13. Amen. The ministerial organization that I'm a member of, the, the uh, um, my Lord, I can't even say the name of it, the <laughs> Ministerial Association of Jesus Christ, it's, it is a minister's fellowship, and in our fellowship there's an application for membership, and one of the questions on the application says, Will you endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit? It doesn't ask us, are we in unity of the faith? Because we don't all believe everything exactly the same way. There's a lot of differences in Christianity... There's a, a, you, you, we all, by and large, are using this book. Amen. Every Christian church in Asheville today that has a service and is having a, a minister to, to bring the word, hopefully they're bringing it out of the Holy Bible. Now, I, I can't guarantee that because years ago when I was in in, uh, in college, I went to a, a church where uh, one Sunday you might come in and it's uh, some weird guy playing a, a sitar. <laughs> and uh, then the next week, it's maybe somebody coming in singing uh, folk songs. And, uh, and uh, so, it, so I'm saying all churches are not that attuned to the Word of God. But the important thing is that we have to be a Bible-based church. It, it is so important for us to know that what you hear across this pulpit is coming from the Word of God and that it is a, a spirit-led interpretation of the Word of God. We all use the same book, but we don't all get the same thing out of it. You know, I mean, hey, they're still arguing about whether to use juice or wine for communion. And speaking of communion, some churches say you need to do it every Sunday, and some say you need to do it every Saturday, and some say you need to do it once every three months or on communion Sunday or whatever. And, of course, the Bible doesn't tell us any of that stuff. It just simply says, as oft as ye do this, do it in remembrance of me. Amen. And so, 
people get differing interpretations and customs develop around those things. Um, and all we can do within the confines of our own ability is to keep the unity of the Spirit until we can come into a unity of the faith. Amen. And, uh, you know, people are struggling what day, what day to go to church. And uh, do we go to church on the Sabbath? Or do we go to church? I don't see, some of y'all think you went to church this morning on the Sabbath. But you didn't. You, you look at your calendar. Look at any calendar that you have. And it starts with, with Sunday. And, or what, is that what it does? It starts with Sunday and goes all the way to Saturday. Amen. And on those calendars, Saturday is the last day. It's the seventh day. You mean Saturday is the Sabbath? Well, according to those calendars, it's the seventh day. But, but we're here on, on Sunday, and Sunday is the first day. And that's exactly right. Because under the law, they observed a day that was called the Sabbath. Yet now, we come to church on Sunday. We come to church on the first day of the week. We give God our first fruits. Well, are we keeping that commandment to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? We are if you are letting the Lord of the Sabbath inhabit your being. You are observing the Sabbath every day of the week. That's what it's really all about. It's recognizing, it's getting that Sabbath within you and letting the Sabbath just emanate from you. Amen. Well, I hope that y'all won't decide to change churches so that you can go to church on Saturday. Amen. Thinking that you might be fulfilling the Word of God. I promise you that's not the case. Amen. The New Testament church... Uh, you know, it, it, it kind of started out that, that Paul and some of the guys would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath and they would, uh, they would preach until they got thrown out. And then the Gentiles would say, well, come over tomorrow and tell, it, tell us about this. And they kind of got in the, in the habit of going to church on that first day of the week. Amen. Now, everybody doesn't believe the same thing. If everyone believed the Word of God exactly the same way, we could say that we were keeping the unity of the faith. But we're not. Uh, just those of us that are sitting right here, some of you do not believe everything the way that I do. And it's really okay. It's really okay. Um... Uh, Say, well, what, 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 do you, what, what, what kind of a difference is there between what some of us believe and some of Well, let me give you an example, and, and y'all need to sit down for this. Oh, and you already are. Uh, I, I don't believe in a holy trinity. Oh, God. Boy, I've kicked it wide open now. I've kicked it wide open now. I don't believe in it. But see, most of us were brought up believing or being taught about the Holy Trinity. But I don't believe in a Holy Trinity. I don't, but it's not in the Bible. That word Trinity is never in the Bible. It's not there. Now, now let, me, let me help you to understand. I believe in the Father. And I believe in the Son, and I believe in the Holy Ghost. I just don't believe in a committee type God. And that's really what this doctrine of 
of the Trinity is all about because, I mean, listen, the Catholic Church put this into effect. It was well established by 325 A.D. that they were teaching about the Holy Trinity. But it was a made-up doctrine. It's not in the Bible. That's what I want you to understand. We cannot get caught up in culture or in, in teachings that's not biblical. Now, if you believe in a holy trinity, that's okay. No one's going to get all crossed up with you. But, but Brother Douglas, if you believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, isn't that the trinity? Well, sort of, but not. And so stay with me for just a minute and don't leave yet. Because by definition, the doctrine of the Trinity says there are three persons in the Godhead. And that those three persons, when you put them together, is the Godhead. And, and, and I've heard it used like, like an egg. Like an egg. An egg has a white and a yolk and a shell. And if you put the yolk and the egg, or the, the yolk and the, and the white and the shell together, you have an egg. And so, under the doctrine of the Trinity, it simply says the yolk is not the white, and the white is not the shell, and the shell is not the yolk. But together they're God. Well, that makes sense. I mean, you know, you've all had an, eaten an egg, and you eat the white, and you eat the yolk, and you don't eat the shell. But that's not really the God that I understand from the Scriptures because I understand that the Father, I'm introduced to the Father in creation. And he is all of God. He's not part of God. He's all of God. And then I'm introduced to the Son in this thing we call redemption. And I don't think he's part of God. I think he's all of God. And... When you experience the infilling of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, you're not experiencing part of God. You're experiencing all of God. So how does that work? Well, let me explain. Instead of using an egg, we can use a glass of water. Now, that glass of water, if I was to turn it upside down, it would all pour out. Now, we had a little electrical short this morning in the church. The baptistry heater uh, breaker just about caught on fire, and it was smelling pretty bad. And uh, uh, Forrest said it, was, it had gotten so hot you couldn't hardly touch it, the box back there, so we had to turn it off. We'll worry about that next week. But if you, I think it was hot enough that you could have boiled water on it. And if you boiled water on it, it would turn into steam. And it would just look like a little bit of puff of cloud going up. But it was that same water. Or if you, if you took that, that same water and you stuck it in the freezer of your refrigerator... You took it out after a while, it would be just hard as a rock. We call it ice. But it's the same water. So it's three different manifestations of water. Amen. So basically, 
You can have ice or you can have steam or you can have liquid water, but it's all the same water. It just appears differently. It's just, its presentation is different. I believe the Father is all of God. I believe the Son is all of God, and I believe the Holy Ghost is all of God. Amen. Amen. I don't want to subdivide God into a committee and just say, okay, this, I'm, a, I, I'm going with this part of God, but I'm not going to go with this part of God. Well, well what do you mean you're not going to go with this part of God? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, I think that the way I perceive the Scripture works better. Now, now, why do I say that? Well, I say that because uh, we understand what fatherhood is all about. Most every one of us here understand that, that uh, fathers have a particular part to play in bringing life into the, into the world. And, uh, and that the father, if we try to explain the relationship between the father and the son, it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. The father is the father of the son. It's a relationship. Okay? But if you go to Matthew 1 and 18, the Bible's talking about the birth of Jesus says that Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So who was the father? Was the father the father or was the Holy Ghost the father? Well, it's not an issue if you understand that the father is the Holy Ghost. It's not an issue if you understand that the Holy Ghost is the Father. But too many times people get the impression that the Holy Ghost is just an agent of God. He's just sent on messages. He's, he, he takes the word. He takes the message. No, it's more than that. It's God working in you. God working through you. Amen. Amen. Well, but what about this son part? Well, you know, in, in the book of Colossians, uh, it tells us, let me keep my place marked here. I don't want to lose that. Uh, in Colossians 2, verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, talking about in Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ Jesus. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So the word of God says that all the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus. Huh. Wow. Uh, let's, do, let's do one more. I like, I like this one because we have to go back into the Old Testament. And uh, in, in the Old Testament, there's a messianic prophecy in, in Isaiah chapter 9 that says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Now this is, keep in mind, that this is, oh, 750 years before the birth of Christ, give or take. And it uh, says, For unto us a child is born. Well, we understand that's Bethlehem. Unto us a son is given, we understand that is Calvary. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And we understand that the government that that's talking about is the cross, the government of the cross. The cross is the only thing that Jesus ever carried on his shoulder. Amen. The government of the cross, when we follow that cross, when we pick up our cross and follow him, we are doing his will. Amen. 
And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, wait. I mean, you know, it's one thing to call him the Everlasting Father, but now you've called him the, the Prince of Peace. They're the same thing. They're the same thing. Amen. Amen. So, um, now, if you want to call it a trinity, that's all right with me. I don't care. I really don't. Um, we have not come into the unity of the faith because we still see too many things differently, but we can still keep the unity of the Spirit. You can believe whatever you want to believe and sit on these pews or these chairs. Um, I, I, had, I had one guy that came in, and he was, he was a pretty wealthy guy, and he says, uh, now, I want to tell you, Brother Douglas, right up front, I don't believe in tithing. And, and, uh, and I, I said to him, I said, I said, well, that doesn't surprise me. I said, I, I, I haven't met many wealthy people that believe in tithing. I said, it's just us poor folks that believe in tithing. Uh, everybody doesn't believe the same thing. Amen. Amen. Um, I still love you even if you don't believe things the way I do. Now, some people don't believe in the Holy Ghost. Well, you know, they believe what it says in the book, but they don't believe in putting it into practice in their lives. You know, to me, when you say, I don't believe in the Holy Ghost, that's like saying, I don't believe in ice cream. Okay? I don't believe in ice cream. Now, why do I say that? I say that because they don't believe, and I keep on licking My pastor used to say, you know, when I'm holding an ice cream cone and you tell me that ice cream ain't no good, it's too late. I've already tried it. It's too late. I've already licked the cone. It's too late. I've already experienced it. Amen. It doesn't matter what I believed before God filled me, but since he filled me, I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Amen. That is the problem that we have in Christianity is that there's not enough people believing in the reality of His Spirit. We need more people to say, something is missing in my experience uh, and I need more of God. I need something to happen in my life that will be more than just the words on the page he is that word. Amen. But he's never intended to stay on the page. Amen. Praise God. Well, that Holy Ghost thing you're talking about is not for us today. And I just keep on licking. That was for them back then. And I just keep on licking whatever but I still love you even if you don't believe everything that I believe some people don't believe in those nine spiritual gifts that Pastor Kana and I did a Bible study on on our fireside chats not long ago it took three nights to, th three sessions to do it the nine spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 you need to be acquainted with those amen some people don't believe they're for the church today. They don't think that they're still active. They just don't think they're, that they're part of the Word anymore, that it was, it was for them back then. You know, that's always such a cop-out to me when they say it was for them back then because they needed it. Oh, my God. Some people don't believe in the gifts of healing, and I just keep on getting healed and seeing other people getting healed. Some people don't believe in miracles, but I still keep seeing miracles happening in the midst of the church. 
Amen. Some people don't believe in the gift of prophecy, but I just keep hearing from God. Some people don't believe in tongues and interpretations, and I just keep on being blessed by it. Some preachers continue to think that they are extra smart, but I'll just keep knowing that God speaks a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge into my mind, and that so much of what he allows me to be part of has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with his gifts to the church. Amen. Not to even mention faith and discerning of spirits and, and so forth. Amen. And what about this tongue business? You know, this, this tongue business is, uh, it, it really, it shakes people up sometimes. Some people just don't believe in all that foolishness. Um, but... Uh, we recently did a, a little video on, on the four uses of tongues in the New Testament church. The four uses of tongues in the New Testament church. And for those of you that are keeping score, only one of those uses of tongues requires an interpretation. Amen. But you'll have to tune in and check it out. Amen. We, uh, we are too quick to accept the accepted doctrine and never search the word with an unbiased mind. Too often our tactics are this is what I believe. Now let me find a word that will support that. And what we really need to be doing is let me find a word that will share truth with me. Amen. Amen. You know, Jesus said this in John 5 and 39. He said, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Wow. First time I read that, I didn't like the way they wrote that. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think you have eternal life. No. I wanted to say, search the scriptures, for in them you have eternal life. No, I have to somehow line up my life with that word to find that eternal experience that I'm looking for. Now, um, another scripture that used to bug me big time, and let me see, it's over in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, the scripture says, um, verse 38, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. Now, get that picture. One of the disciples comes to Jesus and says, Hey, we ran into a guy that was casting out devils in your name, but he's, he doesn't follow us. He's not part of our group. He's not part of our denomination. He's not part of our cluster. He's not in our pod. And notice what Jesus said in response. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me, for he that is not against us is on our part. Oh, man. Boy, that messed up my theology. I had to rethink some things because at one time I, I thought that my little group was the only ones that was going to be saved. And come to find out that there was other people that loved Jesus as much as I did. They just didn't believe everything just the way that I did. 
And I finally had to submit myself to Ephesians chapter 4 and say I need to keep the unity of the Spirit until we can come into the unity of the faith. Now, how do we do that? It tells us very simply. Um, back in Ephesians chapter 4, I told you that everything between verse 3 and verse 13 is for the purpose of getting us from verse 3 to verse 13. Let's look at it for just a minute. Uh, verse 4 talks about there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. <coughs> there's not dozens of churches. There's not dozens of church bodies the Word of God says we are the body of Christ. doesn't say we're one of the bodies of Christ. It says we're the body of Christ. Somehow or other, we have our part to play. And we want to be as attuned with the Word of God as we can be. Um, but there's one body and there's one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. Verse 5 Pretty simple. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We can argue about communion if we want to. It doesn't change anything. Uh, I literally went to one minister's meeting years ago, a big minister's meeting, and they had two tables set up for communion. They had one for the wine drinkers and one for the juice drinkers, and you could decide which was, was, was you know, and uh, so uh, what, what I decided to do a few years ago was we just put some grape juice in a cup and just a few drops of vodka. <laughs> I don't really, brother. I, I don't. <laughs> For all of those out there in radio land, <laughs> we were joking about that. Amen. Praise God. Uh, but, uh, you know, people, are, they, they're still arguing about that. And, and, and they argue about it as though it's a life or death issue. It is a salvation issue, you know. So uh, there's people that believe that Jesus turned the water into grape juice. But that's not what the Bible said. Oh, yeah, but it, was, it, was, it wasn't fermented yet. And, 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 and he would never do that. He did. Uh, you can try to make grape juice out of it if you want to, but it was wine. Uh, if it wasn't wine, he wouldn't have to give us the admonitions to not drink too much. Amen. Amen. So, on Wednesday night, we always have a good meal, and we have some sodas, and for about the last three weeks, I've been pulling out a jug of juice for those that, that don't want carbonated or caffeinated stuff, some nice fresh juice. I can't, I can't hardly give the juice away. Nobody will drink the juice. They always want the stuff that'll give you cancer. They always want the stuff that'll, 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 that'll mess up your stomach. They, and that'll, that'll fatten you up, all this stuff. They, they want what's bad for you, and I'm right there with them. I'm, dr I'm, drinking, the, I'm drinking the hard core Coke. Amen. But we do have the alternative there. You can drink juice if you prefer. Amen. And uh, I, I don't know what the response would be if I put a bottle of wine out there, so I, I, I'm, I'm not even going to think about that. Um, so, we have this verse. Let me go down here. One Lord, one Father. Um, our God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wow. Wow. Um, down in verse 11, it says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And, and, and we talk about this is the equipping gifts. This is 
the ministry that God has put forth in the world to, to help us to get from verse 3 to verse 13. And I want to call your attention to verse number 12. For the purpose of that fivefold ministry is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is not a multiple choice there. That is a singular phrase. It is for the perfecting of the saints or for the maturing of the saints that they may do the work of the ministry and that so that the, that the body of Christ might be edified. And that is God's plan for us, for us to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God, for us to continue to move in a great way um, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to, well, let me get back over here. I've got to find that scripture that I didn't mark. Do, is it your experience that sometimes you read the Bible and it makes no sense whatsoever? Anybody have that experience? Read something, makes no sense. Then somebody will get up and preach it, and you'll think, wow, that's what that means. And it makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to close out by just giving you one, one verse of Scripture that I think that will, I hope this will bless you. Um, in Matthew chapter 12, I don't, don't think you have that one back there, Marianne, but Matthew chapter 12, um, there's a passage of Scripture that begins in verse number 15. Um, the Pharisees had seen Jesus heal somebody on a Saturday, on the Sabbath, and uh, immediately started conspiring to put him to death, and... Uh, and, 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 of course, Jesus knew it, and, and uh, it goes on down, and it talks about the fulfillment, the fulfillment of an old, an old prophecy from the book of Isaiah. And I want to read that prophecy there uh, because it is, it, is re it is recorded from the book of Isaiah, and it begins... In verse 18, it's what we call a messianic prophecy. It is a, it is a prophecy from the Old Testament uh, that, that basically refers to the coming of the Messiah, and it tells us something so very, very pertinent to uh, the coming of the Messiah. It says, verse 18, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. In other words, he's not going to make a big publication. He is not going to have a big uh, healing ministry and, and get up on a platform with signs and, and bullhorns and all of this, okay? What he's going to do, he's going to do it quietly. He's going to do it. He even tells people, don't, don't, you know, he'd heal people and say, just don't say anything about it. Just, just go, go home. Don't say anything about it. You know, of course, they, they wouldn't do that. But, uh, and, uh, and verse 20 says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. That passage of scripture made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. For years, it just didn't make any sense. A bruised reed shall he not break. And smoking flax shall he not quench. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. 
And then through a process, God revealed to me this most amazing thing. And hopefully it will help you. You know, you can recall from the days of Moses when Moses' mother wove a basket and and tarred it in and out and put the baby in there and put him floating in the river among the reeds. This was a common sight along the sides of the Nile River was reeds that grew up wild. But, But something very interesting in the culture of that day is that a hollow reed was oftentimes used to make different kinds of musical instruments. Some of the most primitive flutes were just a piece of of reed that had been cut with holes put in just the right places and you could just blow through that and 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 cover the holes and it would make different sounds and and uh, very, very similar to what a clarinet might do or, or a flute might do and, and these kind of things. But this scripture said, a bruised reed shall he not break. Well, what does that really mean? Well, it's like this. Sometimes people went walking out into the edge of the water and they would push the reeds out of the way And sometimes just in simply doing that to a green reed, it would bruise the reed. Now, basically what that would do is it would make it not fit to make a musical instrument out of. And so if someone goes out into the edge of the water and they're looking for reeds and they're wanting to make a musical instrument, something that would just bless others with just a sound of rejoicing, and they're looking for just the right reed, and they would come along and they would find reeds that had been bruised by the passing of someone previous to their visit. And because uh, they may, that may be the place where they would come often to, to find the reeds that they needed to manufacture the instruments that they wanted, that they would find those bruised reeds and they would snap them, they would break them so that they wouldn't have to mistakenly grab that one the next time they came. They just broke it to get it out of the way. You're no good for what my purpose is I'm breaking you I'm through with you I will not ever worry about trying to redeem you but this scripture said concerning the coming Messiah concerning Jesus a bruised reed shall he not break what does that mean well Anybody ever been bruised? Has life been tough sometimes? Have you gone through stuff that you came through it with battle scars? That you came through it and you were, you might have looked pretty rough? It might not have been physical. It might have been totally emotional. It might have been something got a hold of you in such a way in your relationships with other people or in your, in, in your trek through life that you were just trying You were just doing the best you could, but life had sent you on a journey and you came out the other end worse for wear. And some of the things that you had been through and some of the choices that you had made had caused you perhaps to be bitter in your heart or just bruised in your spirit and you didn't think that anything could ever fix it you were a bruised reed and anybody with any sense would just break you and push you out of the way but when Jesus came along when Jesus came along he said I know what you've been through I know 
what's going on with you. I know where your heart is. I know where your mind is. I know the tough times that you've had. But I'm not throwing you away. I'm not discarding you because I can do anything even with a bruised reed. I'm not going to break you. I'm going to fix you. Amen. And the latter part of that scripture simply said, And smoking flax shall he not quench. We don't really appreciate this. Now, I grew up in a house where in Louisiana we'd have hurricanes on a regular basis. And despite what they say about global warming increasing them, we had as many hurricanes when I was a kid as we're having now. And a whole lot more people died back then from them. But we always knew that when we had a bad storm, the electricity was going to go out. But Grandma had some nice kerosene lantern lamps, nice glass, beautiful kerosene lamps that would have a wick, and you just take the globe off and light it and stick the globe back on, and, and you'd have light. Back in Jesus' day, they had something similar. Of course, they didn't have the electricity and didn't have the other conveniences. They had to light with lamps that burned some kind of oil. And they were usually little clay vessels just made from mud, made from red clay. And they would just be a little round thing. Uh, it wouldn't be nearly as good looking as this oil container. But this does have a little spout and a little handle. Those would be a little bit wider on one side they would just be a little little spout where you could uh, you could pour something out of it if you wanted to and on the other side there'd be a little handle and typically to use for a lamp you would take a wick that was woven from flax flax that just grew in fact flax is what they make linen out of one of the oldest fabrics. In fact, the, 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 uh, the swaddling clothes that Jesus was wrapped in was made from flax, a plant that grew. And they would weave that flax into a wick that would not be dissimilar from the ones that we used in our old lanterns. And they would put oil in that lamp, and they would take a wick, and they would stick one end of it in the oil, and they would just hang the other end of that wick, that flax wick, out of the spout side of that lamp. And the flax would kind of soak the oil up, and, and somehow or other it would just, uh, it worked real well because you could light that wick, and as long as there was oil in the lamp, the wick itself did not burn but the oil burned. And oftentimes they would use scented oils that would put a beautiful fragrance in the house and they could light a lamp and they could have light and beautiful aroma. But invariably, sometimes someone didn't watch closely and the oil would run out in the lamp. And when the oil would run out in the lamp, once the last of the oil was burned, the flax itself would begin to smolder. Perhaps the woman of the house had just gone out to hang some clothes on the clothesline or had just gone out to take care of some little chore outside and the oil ran out and the flax began to smolder and begin to smoke. And there's nothing that would stink worse 
than the smell of that smoldering flax burning when it had no oil. And very quickly the house would fill up with that horrible, uh, that horrible smell and, and, and the smoke. And she might come back in the house and realize, oh, I've let the oil run out. And she would very quickly run and grab that wick and would pinch it between her fingers and smolder just to mash out the, 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 the fire. And she would throw it out the window or throw it out the door to get that smoking flax out of the house. But this scripture says, and smoking flax shall he not quench. What does that say about us? You see, sometimes even when we've had a relationship with God, we've had a walk with God, we have been in a, an, an intimate relationship with Him for some time. We not only called ourselves a Christian, but we lived that life. And then things happen that caused us to pull away, that caused us to let the oil of the Holy Ghost become depleted. We quit praying. We quit trusting. We got mad at somebody at church and quit going. We just, we just let our spiritual lives dry up. And the, the flax of our life began to smolder. And what used to be the most fragrant and glorious light shining in our lives became something of darkness and despair and disgust. But this says Jesus is not going to pinch us between his fingers and throw us away. Even when we've made a mistake, even when we've been less than perfect, he said, just come unto me. Let me fill you again. Let me refresh you again. Let me give you an opportunity, another chance. Yes, I know that you're not where you used to be, but you can be. Powerful, powerful words from an Old Testament prophet that Jesus basically let us know this is about me. Amen. Maybe you can find yourself in that story somewhere. I don't know. But what I do know is that God loves you. And God loves me. Even though He has found that I'm not perfect, He has discovered that I make mistakes, that I fall short of His glory. That sometimes my righteousness becomes as filthy rags. It's His righteousness. It's His righteousness that will keep my flax smelling fragrant. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to keep getting along until we finally get it. We're going to keep getting along until perhaps we all arrive at the same place. I think that's God's plan. And the things that I misunderstand, perhaps you understand them better. And the things that you perhaps haven't quite understood yet, perhaps I can help with that in your life. 
Let's close our eyes and just lift our hands and ask God to bless us right now. In Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Help me, God, to be a genuine Christian, to love the way that you love. Lord, to serve the way that you serve. Let me be a vessel in your hands and help me. Help me to do all that I can do that others might come to you. In Jesus' name. Thank you. If anyone needs prayer, if anyone needs to be anointed, anyone needs to be baptized, all of those things can happen this morning if you have a need. So as Sister Douglas sings, this is your opportunity to come before the Lord and just ask for His divine touch. Praise God. Uh, if you're going out for lunch, we're going to give you a head start on the big churches. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Glad to have everyone with us today. Pray for those that are traveling. Pray for those that are out of pocket. And... Uh, those that have a special need do pray for sister debbie waters in fact i need some women of faith to come up here and uh, we're going to pray for sister debbie waters i don't i haven't heard back yet don't know what's going on she's probably sitting in the er waiting where she's been for several hours i just don't know amen Lord bless you. You are dismissed in the fear of the Lord. Greet each other in Jesus' name. Come back when you're supposed to. Amen.